for April 4th. So uh, our very first item on the agenda, which makes me very happy as a chemist, uh, is uh, by Rebecca Esselman, uh, who's going to tell us about uh, PAH contamination. For, for those of you who don't know what PAHs are, they aren't um, PhDs that didn't quite make it. They are, that stands for polynuclear aromatic hydrocarbons. Uh, and uh, well, one of the most familiar versions of those are the, the nasty things that show up in, for example, cigarette smoke and give people lung cancer. So that's the category of molecules that uh, turn out to be of concern in uh, the contamination that Rebecca is going to tell us about. So welcome, uh, Rebecca, and uh, please introduce yourself and your background first, and then tell us, uh, tell us a story. This is, of course, part of our Green Themes uh, series. Well, thank you for having me up tonight. I'm Rebecca Esselman. I'm a watershed planner with the Huron River Watershed Council. And for those of you who might not be familiar, um, the headwaters of the Huron are just a little bit south of here. Um, we're an organization that focuses on water resource protection, primarily of the Huron River, but um, we regularly engage on issues uh, with broader implications for water resource protection at the state and regional level, and these pavement sealants have been one of those issues that, um, that we have stepped outside of our watershed boundaries and, and have been talking with groups such as yourself um, to raise awareness about it and talk about what we can do. So, um, this issue came across our desk um, not that long ago. In, t in 2014, we were contacted by Freshwater Future, which is a Great Lakes regional group focused on freshwater. And they were trying to raise awareness about pavement sealants and the toxics that they contain um, in the Great Lakes region, kind of on the heels of Minnesota passing a statewide ban on uh, coal tar sealants. And after doing some due diligence and, and taking a look at the issue ourselves, we decided to pick it up in earnest. And ever since then, we've been talking to groups like yours, um, talking to residents, talking to legislators, and really trying to get some traction uh, in the state of Michigan um, on the pavement sealing issue. So I um, shared with you guys a couple of um, documents ahead of today's meeting, that USGS fact sheet. Um, to me is one of the best summaries of the science out there on um, pavement sealers and pH uh, contamination. And so I will go over that content a little bit, but not a lot, assuming that, that, um, that you all have done that reading. Um, but for anyone watching at home, I'll, I'll give an overview of it. Um, and then we can have a discussion uh, where you guys can you know, ask any questions that came up as you were viewing the content. I also shared a model ordinance uh, that we um, share with communities that we talk to about this. And um, I'll also talk with you about what actions have taken place in Michigan already. Um, and a number of communities have adopted ordinances to, to prohibit the use of um, high PAH uh, pavement sealants in their municipalities. So we'll get to that too. To, to back up a little bit, uh, what are pavement sealants, for those that don't know, because prior to 2014, I didn't really know. I mean, I did know. I remember, you know, everybody's driven down a, a two-lane road and seeing a sign in a front yard and a freshly uh, glazed over uh, asphalt driveway that looks shiny black and, and new. Um, but I hadn't thought too much about what that stuff was and, and where it might go once it leaves the driveway. So it's that black liquid that's sprayed on low traffic asphalt surfaces. Um, it's marketed as a beautifying product and something that increases the longevity of your asphalt surface. And most seal coats that are available now are either coal tar based or asphalt based. Um, of course, in recent years now, there's been um, some alternative uh, based products coming to market as well in part as a response to some backlash against the coal tar sealants. And this has made the issue a little bit more complicated because um, those sealant bases are, can also be very high in PAHs, which are the contaminants of concern, but they're not coal tar. So some of the earliest entities that regulated pavement sealants said coal tar no, anything else is fine. 
that's no longer sufficient because some of the alternatives are now also, uh, they still remain high in PAHs, which is what we're concerned about. Uh, this stuff is applied on low traffic asphalt surfaces, so it's driveways, it's parking lots, it's trails, sometimes it's schoolyards, um, I think airports, strip malls, your bank, all of those um, types of surfaces are pretty regularly uh, seal coated as a maintenance practice. I don't know if I mentioned this, but they, the industry recommends sealing every two to three years which means that in those two to three years, the stuff weathers off and needs to be reapplied. And it doesn't just go away, of course. It has to go somewhere, and that's sort of where the problem begins. Uh, seal coats are not used on heavy traffic roads, um, so that's not um, uh, where the issue comes, to, comes into play. Um, it's also uh, an east of the Rockies issue. Uh, coal tar is a byproduct of the steel industry, uh, which we have in spades here, um, but shipping across the Rockies has become um, less economically viable, so they are primarily using the asphalt based on the west coast, um, but those of us east of the Rockies, um, uh, primarily the seal coating that's done has historically been this coal tar based seal coat. We're talking to the tune of 85 million gallons per year of coal tar seal coat are sold in the U.S. Um, like I said, if you pay attention, every spring you see this happening on you know every third driveway or so and in parking lots. So it's very ubiquitous practice, and uh, a lot of area is covered with this stuff um, every year. <coughs> when we started reaching out to area applicators. Um, when we were learning more about the issue, all but one was applying coal tar. So it is the seal coat of choice among the applicators. And um, you know, if you see seal coating done, uh, most likely what you're seeing is, is that high pH um, seal coat. There, this is changing now a little bit in response to some of the advocacy that's happened and consumer awareness. So some <coughs> applicators are applying alternatives, um, but we really are working within an industry that prefers the, the coal tar product. So the problem with the coal tar based sealants, um, they're 5% or more polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Um, these um, once the, once the application has occurred, uh, immediately we start losing those pHs to the environment. The most obvious loss is you smell it, right? So as it's curing, you get the volatilized pHs and there's an exposure pathway there. That's most impactful to the applicators and the homeowner maybe. Um, but then over time, this stuff weathers off, ends up in our soil, <clears throat> in our, tracked in on our feet and in our homes and carpeting. Um, it ends up in our stormwater systems, uh, which was, um, you know, contaminated sediment uh, disposal costs was something that really tipped the scales in Minnesota that led to the Minnesota ban. And the, the stormwater systems were so contaminated with pHs that they needed more expensive um, disposal uh, facilities to, to get rid of this stuff. And then it also ends up in our lakes and rivers. Uh, we found that, or not we, but the uh, research of, researchers have found that uh, when they start looking at sediments uh, in the Great Lakes region for pHs, um, 50 to 75 percent of those pHs can be traced back to that single source. So there's a lot of sources of pHs in our environment, and there's no way we're going to regulate all of them, but we know that this one thing is contributing, uh, you know, half or more of the pH contamination in our sediments. And so, um, you know, to me, it's this very kind of elegant environmental problem if, if there is such a thing, because it's a product that has an alternative. It's a major contributor to pH contamination in our environment, and, and we don't need to be using it. Um, it has serious environmental and human health implications, um, most of which are captured pretty well in that USGS fact sheet. 
And the, the only major opposition to action on this issue is coming from the industry it's, itself, as you would suspect. Um, it's, you know, there, there are actually a few notable exceptions within industry. Um, there are uh, manufacturers that are developing low PAH um, uh, seal coats. Um, Yes, because there's a market, but also because it's the right thing to do. And there are applicators that, you know, the, the one applicator I mentioned in our initial research had made the switch to the asphalt-based seal coat long before we were aware of the issue because he was aware of the issue. His wife became pregnant, and he's like, I'm no longer comfortable using this stuff anymore, and he made the switch himself. And so there are... Um, there are exceptions uh, within industry, but in general, the, the pushback we get is from industry. Uh, the main human health concern is that um, pHs are, um, or that coal tar pitch, which is, I feel like this keeps going out, coal tar pitch, which is a, um, the, the base ingredient in these coal tar sealants is a, is a, a class one carcinogen. So this is a known human, known to cause cancer in humans. <coughs> uh, research has found that people that live adjacent to coal tar sealed driveways have a 38 have 38 times greater chance uh, or cancer risk than those that do not. And this impacts children uh, disproportionately because of the way they interact with the environment. They're the ones down at pavement level. They're the ones down at carpet level. They're the ones putting things in their mouths. And these are all exposure pathways. Um, there are other uh, human impacts. Um, Damaged embryos and fetuses, lower IQ, childhood asthma, low birth weight, heart malformations, and others that have been linked to, to coal tar. Um, as far as the environmental concerns, um, the USGS has done the majority of research on um, not pH, uh, um, contamination, or not not the toxicity of PAHs specifically, but the PAHs in coal tar sealants. And so they've done a series of studies with uh, runoff, with house dust, um, that have um, linked the runoff from coal tar treated surfaces to a uh, myriad of uh, impacts on uh, uh, freshwater organisms, uh, uh, insects, and fish. Um, there's been research out of Oregon State University, so the, the USGS research has come under uh, pretty severe scrutiny uh, by the industry, um, but there is a growing body of evidence from entities that are not USGS corroborating the, the kind of story that USGS has, has arrived at through the research that they've done. Uh, there was a group at Oregon State University that um, actually published uh, research that said, in fact, these are more toxic than the USGS was putting forward when they looked at a broader suite of PAHs that are contained in, in uh, coal tar sealants than, than what the USGS studies had looked at. So um, the evidence is becoming broader and deeper um, that this stuff is really impactful to both human health and our environment. There are alternatives, as I mentioned earlier, the asphalt-based seal coats have a fraction of the PAH content, like one one thousandth the PAH content. The price per gallon is similar. Um, manufacturers and suppliers within Michigan do stock asphalt-based um, supplies, so the companies that make a living uh, seal coating have access to the safer alternative. Um, they go to the same place, they just fill up their tank with a different product. And we do have some examples of local businesses that have successfully built their business and a competitive business using the asphalt-based products. But another alternative that, that, um, that has shown up as we've been talking with entities, uh, particularly those that contract seal coders, is that um, not everybody uh, believes that seal coating is actually a necessary step to increase the longevity of your pavement. So University of Michigan um, you, uh, typically does not use seal coating as a maintenance practice, except in certain uh, 
uh, circumstances. Uh, Meyer was the other company that we found does not do seal coating. So there's, there's groups out there that, let's say, we're just going to repave. We don't see a, a value in seal coating as far as a money put into to, you know, pavement life that we, we gain from it. So there's some different opinions about the value of seal coating um, at all. So in response, what we've seen, um, the first ban in the U.S. was in Austin, Texas, uh, about 12 years ago now. Um, and in the time, it's in, it was because of that, the connection made between seal coating and pH contamination in, in their sediments um, that USGS really started investigating uh, the issue. Um, in the 12 years since that ban has passed, they ha are measuring 58% less pHs in their, in their sediments. So this stuff does take time to move through the environment. These are persistent bioaccumulative chemicals, but they do eventually move through the system uh, once the inputs have stopped. Uh, we've also seen Washington, Minnesota, and D.C. pass statewide bans, and then dozens of cities, counties, and townships throughout the U.S. are following suit. Uh, I've lost count of how many, but it's a growing number. And the last calculation um, somebody did in 2017 was that about 22.5 million Americans are now under uh, sealant bans, which is a, a fraction of our, our country, but it's a big and growing number. So locally... We've had 14 communities in Michigan already pass bans. Uh, it looks like Clarkston might become the next, uh, the 15th, uh, sometime this month. We're seeing applicators uh, switch what they are applying. Um, in 2016, the uh, public health sector weighed in on this issue. The S Michigan State Medical Society, which is a um, network of 15,000 physicians in Michigan, uh, passed a resolution to support state-level action uh, to prohibit the use of coal tar sealants in Michigan. Um, we've had state legislation introduced in both the House and Senate for several years. Uh, they tend to go nowhere once they're there, but we do have legislators that are regularly bringing it up at the state level. And then we've also seen the DEQ and USGS uh, do some sampling in our state, um, and the results are pending. I'm hoping that we'll see some results from that research uh, this as early as this summer. Um, so that's kind of the overview of the issue um, before we head into to Q&A. Um, but before we do that, um, what I like to propose to the group is a few courses of action. Um, the ideal is to, to pass a local ordinance. Um, the, you'll, if you reviewed the ordinance, you'll see that we are proposing uh, regulating high PAH sealants rather than coal tar. And this gets back to that issue of these emerging alternatives that are not coal tar but are high PAH. Michigan is the first place on the map that is doing that. Um, but all of the ordinances that, that have happened in Michigan um, do regulate pH level to 0.1%. Uh, Milwaukee just passed a ban recently and is regulating um, pH level as well. So um, that's, that's the reason for that aspect of the, of the ordinance. The other things that a, a municipality can do is educate your citizens. So through whatever channel you have, um, newsletter articles, um, social media, um, tabling events, uh, you can talk with people about the issue so that they can make informed choices. And then um, you could also eliminate the use of uh, high pH pavement sealants on township property. I don't know if that amounts to much, but, but it is um, a step that could be taken that would reduce uh, the amount of um, the pollutant in the, the area. And then finally, encourage your state representatives to either introduce um, uh, state-level legislation on this issue or sign on as a co-sponsor to uh, legislation that is being introduced. So with that, I'll, I'll take questions. Yeah, I'm just curious if, um, as to the reasoning behind the resistance, if the, the alternative is available. It sounds like it's similar cost. I'm just curious as to 
what the downside of, from the industry perspective, what the downside is to that alternative? Uh, primarily, I hear performance. Okay. That the, the coal tar is the preferred, you know, it, it lasts longer on the pavement and does the job better. I believe that I read, or maybe somebody mentioned this to me, that the major retailers like Home Depot and Lowe's aren't carrying coal tar products anymore. Is Do you know, is that true? That is true, yeah. yeah. And we even checked that for our area at, uh, at the outset. Um, that, that action happened quite a while ago after the Austin ban and some of the USGS science. It was just deemed a liability, and there was no need to have the coal tar on the shelves since there was the asphalt alternative. So they were still able to supply their customers with the sealant product, but not have the liability associated with um, the, the coal tar base. Well, in a practical sense, you know, homeowners who go to Home Depot, I mean, they don't even realize it, but they're using an asphalt-based uh, sealer when yeah. they do their own job, uh, which is, I think, makes enforcement somewhat easier, maybe, that you don't have to at least worry about the homeowner, do it yourself. But let me ask you, do you know the experience of Ann Arbor or the other communities in Michigan? Have they had any, uh, uh, let's say, problems or issues with enforcement? Yeah, um, some, but they are, you know, resolving them the way you would any infraction. So um, to, to your first point, very, um, it is true that folks that are doing it themselves are not using the high pH sealants, uh, but very few people do it themselves. It's a really nasty job. So by and large, it is the, the companies that are they're doing the application. As far as enforcement goes, um, you know, there's a couple things that communities are doing to help with enforcement. First of all, I highly recommend if you do an ordinance, you uh, require registration. Uh, have the companies come in at the beginning of the year, share with you what product they're going to be using, it's kind of a handshake agreement between you and the, the applicator company that says, I know that I'm working in a community that um, you know, doesn't allow these certain products. I'm going to be applying this one. And, um, and that helps you know who's applying in your area. And if they've come through your door, they've, they're aware of the ordinance and they've committed to, to complying. In the case, this is where uh, the other thing that I recommend, <clears throat> excuse me, is a, a pretty hefty penalty. Um, in places where there's no uh, penalty for um, the infraction, there it's kind of written off as the, the cost of doing business, or can be. Um, the f there's been a couple of examples uh, in Sio Township. Uh, this is something that I think all communities will deal with. There are these companies that come in from out of town, so the registration really helps with your local companies, the people that you know do business in, in the township regularly and have for years. But there are companies that will come in and try to do a really quick job um, and get in and out. Um, even in the absence of ordinances, these companies aren't always operating on the up and up. They, within the industry, there's, you know, um, uh, bad blood there, I guess sometimes you might characterize it as because they'll over dilute products or they'll charge too much or they kind of come in and just don't really run scrupulous businesses. Um, in the case of SIO, it was one of these companies that came in, sold nine or ten households, uh, a seal coat job, said it was a safe alternative. One of the residents called and said it smells like you know, the coal tar has a particular smell. He said, I think um, that I was duped here. And we came, they came out and they, they did, um, uh, there's a, a field test you can do to get a kind of first uh, indication of whether it's a coal tar product or not. And indeed it was. And so they um, worked with the police department and uh, they're in legal proceedings now with this company. In Dexter, um, it was sort of, uh, there was an incident where um, a company was hired to do some pavement work on a shopping mall um, uh, parking lot and just uh, innocently <laughs> did, uh, started putting down the wrong stuff, maybe unaware of the ordinance or something slipped through the cracks and um, Dexter caught the process halfway through. They stopped the work. 
they switch to the safer alternative and there's some the the company is being very cooperative with remediation of the area that was sealed with the toxic seal coat so it's um it's just kind of happening on an as-needed basis you know in dc they have a certain quota of um, field tests that they do on um, on paved surfaces on sealed surfaces every year but dc has staff and resources to do that they'll go do a field test if they suspect it's coal tar they'll send it to a lab and then um, they'll issue an infraction if that if in case in fact it is um, but one thing that they said is they've had a um, ordinance in pl place uh, for a while now and the um, there's almost no infractions anymore people get it they've learned to comply they you know are working with the product that they're not comfortable with and um, compliance is, is much higher than it was at the beginning so you mentioned remediation so uh, let's say you know uh, there are a couple issues. One is, first of all, coming back to Kirk's question, I don't really understand, I still don't understand what the motivation to use a bad product is if it's not cheaper or something. It's just performance and it's that big a difference that people are motivated to, to do something that's clearly this bad uh, <laughs> anyway. And the other question is just remediation. So, you know, let's say uh, somebody has done that and they didn't learn about this issue and then this year now you know their driveway has been coated with this stuff for a year and they want to do something to minimize the mobility and the exposure uh, of people to the uh, the PAHs are there uh, strategies for for example is there a second layer of seal coat you can put down that will actually somehow immobilize the uh, the materials for example yeah I mean, the, the two remediation techniques I've heard of um, one is uh, easier but less effective the other one is pretty intense um, so the the, the um, kind of encapsulation which you're talking about like uh, covering over it with the asphalt based or safer sealant product uh, is the low-hanging fruit for remediation um, in Austin I believe it's in Austin they require two layers of the asphalt base to cover the coal tar and the bottom layer has to be colored so that they can see when you're experiencing the wear and when you have to recoat. Um, you know, it's imperfect because that stuff is going to wear at some point and, and yeah. get into your environment. But um, for the near term and if you kept up on the, the, the encapsulation, uh, that's a decent remediation technique. Um, the other is um, it's a removal and it's like a sandblasting vacuuming you know it's a special piece of equipment that I've still been trying to learn whether we have one of these in southeast Michigan I, I think we probably do for some applications but so far I haven't surfaced a, a company that that owns this machinery but um, in DC they're required to actually remove the seal coat and um, using the shop blast technique um, Every day that this the seal coat stays on there and is not removed, there's uh, additional fines. So um, there's the high touch and the low touch, um, and they're both a little bit tricky. So ideally, it just doesn't get laid down in the first place. Yeah, yeah. As, <clears throat> as a homeowner or a neighbor, uh, you may have said something like this, but would I know if my neighbor is putting the wrong one on or the right one is is the odor something that I could pick up with you know without a trained yeah what nose? I've heard I don't know firsthand but what I've heard is that the coal tar smells like creosote like uh, mothballs mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> there's also to the educated eye a difference in the blackness and the sheen but you know if it's just to the lay eye I don't think I could tell the difference. Mm -hmm. um, so that this the smell is probably um, your best cue. But the other thing is, if you do registration in your community, a neighbor can call and say, "Hey, I saw such and such company at my neighbor's. Are they registered with the township?" And if you guys have them, you know, registered, that is um, at least some indication that they're probably not applying the non-compliant products. I think I also heard you say that that one of the reasons that 
a company might put it on is, did you say that it lasts longer? Yes. And if that's the case, then it would be arguable that it's cheaper to put down because you'd only have to put down every, I don't know. Two to three, three every one day, rather than one to two. Yeah. Instead of five or something like that. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I think that this is why in um, something I'm seeing promising is industries responding by kind of innovating with their products. And so there is product development happening. Um, the downside of it is we're getting high pH non-coal tar sealants out there, but the upside is, I, you know, hopefully they'll crack the nut and they'll get a high performance, low pH sealant um, in the future here, and we'll all win. Um, in the meantime, there's these trade-offs associated with the different products. Um, you know, from the folks that I know that are applying the asphalt-based, um, they feel comfortable with the product that they're selling homeowners and feel like with appropriate application technique and weather conditions that they get high performance out of the asphalt based but that's not um, an opinion shared you know throughout the industry so there's some just like this is what we've always done um, this is what we know how to do and do well and this is what we want to sell you because it's the product we believe in so um, you know some of its habit uh, some of it is probably performance um, the other thing I've heard is, you know, you think about low flush toilets. When those things first came online, it was just a bad idea <laughs> to install them. And then they got better and better and better. And even though, but the stigma maybe of those initial ones took some time to kind of undo in the general public knowledge. And so people shied away from these, even though they were high performing eventually because, you know, innovation, you know, um, uh, allowed us uh, better performing low flow toilets, right? So I feel like something similar is happening in that industry where the asphalt based products are getting better. Um, maybe not as good as the coal tar, um, but it may not be conventional wisdom at this point. Well, what is the, uh, the, you, the model ordinance that's in our packet? What's the source? I mean, who, who developed that? It was, it came to us originally from, um, we looked at Austin's and we looked at Minnesota's, um, and then we modified it um, for PAH level as this uh, emerging alternatives issue showed up. So you, you were the source then? The Watership Council drafted the ordinance. Okay. Mm -hmm. A second question on that, uh, I mean, it seems, the, uh, the model ordinance seems pretty straightforward, but... I was a little surprised that it, it, there's an annual registration, right? And I was thinking, why wouldn't you just have them register once? And then it seems less less cumbersome to just do it uh, initially. And then, obviously, if you're going to be new, then you would have to register. Yeah. yeah um I think it's a point of communication between the township and the company. These companies... Um, some of them are have been in business for decades, but a lot of them come and go pretty quickly. Um, and I, th you know, um, it gives you an opportunity to to stay connected to the community by doing it annually, and just making sure that if leadership changes or ownership or anything, that people are still aware that um, you know what they should be putting in their trucks. For the very first. Chemically induced cancer was from PAHs, and uh, I was curious about the workers. Is there a significant um, recognition of, you know, presumably they're exposed a lot, and is there enough history and, and evaluation of their lives to know that their exposures have led to increases in actual cancer? No, I haven't seen anything making that connection. In fact, that's one of the 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 legs the industry stands on pretty strong is that there's not been that tie between the applicators and the cancers, but it is very difficult to connect a cancer to a source of that cancer. Um, however, the anecdotal information that I hear is not about the cancer, but just about kind of the noxiousness of the product to work with, skin burns, eye burning, nose issues, that kind of thing. And so, you know, I, I share the anecdote about this, the, the applicator in Dexter switching because his wife got pregnant and he kind of understood 
um, the, I just wanted to avoid the exposure for her. Um, the Another anecdote I can share is that as these ordinances started to pass and companies were switching, um, applicators were excited to switch who they worked for <laughs> to those that were applying the asphalt-based seal coat. Um, I don't have, um, I don't know how often that happened or to what degree, but I think there is, you know, for the, the people working in the field actually standing over this stuff, um, I think they feel it. Well, you, it had the number in here, 30, a factor of 38 is an enormous number. And, you know, I would think that the people who are actually working with it on a regular basis would be, you know, that much more at risk, presumably. And so I was, it, it ought to stand out if there was any, you know, numerical data available. Mm -hmm. That's what I was just curious about. Yeah. Hmm. So the other question along those lines is, you know, that's a big number. Uh, you know, to what extent is my neighbor liable if I get cancer? Oh. If he's applied uh, <laughs> this, you know, every two years for the last 10 years or whatever, last for. Yeah, that's outside of what I can comment on. But, yeah. um, you know, it is it is unfortunate how um, how ubiquitous this stuff is. I well, grew I mean, up cigarette, next to you a, know, yeah. Yeah. there actually was, you know, mm -hmm. successful law, legal uh, responsibility ascribed to cigarette smoking eventually. It took mm -hmm. 50 or 60 years. <laughs> <laughs> in producing um, town gas, so there are coal tar. There are coal tar contaminated sites all over. I mean, there's one in Grand Rapid and Grand Ledge. That's why I, when you said the smell, because yeah. I was out okay. there when they actually did some of the borings. Um, so you, it does smell like mothballs. Yeah, I mean it's just because. Now, are there any other communities in the area that have? Um, passed an ordinance like this or, you know, that we'd kind of be on the backs of or? Well, so um, the, the of the 14 communities, 13 of them are in southeast Michigan. Uh, I did talk to East Lansing's Environmental Commission last year. Um, they did not, have not taken action to this point, but it would be great if both communities would do that. Um, you know, I think that's actually helpful to the applicator community as well to have, um, you know, if uh, uh, they can only put one type of seal coat in their tank, so yeah. if they can empty that tank in an area, that's, that's helpful. Um, close by here, so there are Wolverine Lake, Hamburg, um, West Bloomfield, Grosseal, and then all sorts of uh, Pickney, Dexter, Sow Township, Ann Arbor, Ann Arbor Township, Van Buren Township, Ypsilanti. Uh, so there's there's quite a few in this part, you know, southern lower Michigan, mm -hmm. um, but not right up here. You guys would be the first. So uh, my question is more about kind of the process by which we adopt a code. Have you ran into any communities that started down the path of regulating the sealants and for some reason ran into some kind of opposition? Like, is there things that we need to be aware of or some kind of guidance in that realm? When we first started advocating for um, ordinances, uh, the Pavement Coatings Technology Council would show up and um, share their side of the story. Um, but in all cases, the communities proceeded to pass the ordinances anyway. Um, the, in some of those early meetings, as some of the applicator community came, um, but again, um, the, the, there was not a large outcry and the communities proceeded. I, it, you talked about fines uh, being the, um, the leverage I guess I'm curious, uh, are there any cases where an ordinance called for a fine um, to be levied against the purchaser, the homeowner? I, I believe the language in the ordinance um, allows for either, but um, the, 
so f there has not been a homeowner penalized, um, to my knowledge. Uh, it's, m you know, uh, more to be an ins disincentive for the companies. In the cases where that we've had where um, res homeowners have the had the coal tar applied, it was without them knowing. So, yeah. I think you would, you know, there might be a, a sliding scale. <laughs> you know, like maybe if, if, if a homeowner was um, non-compliant intentionally, that might be a different uh, fee than, than a company that may have done it repeatedly, you know, just depending on the nature of the, the infraction. Down on Jolly Road, there's the, it's connected to MSU, but there's the, is some, the Institute for Pavement Protection or something like that. There's a, there's yeah, a, there's a pavement, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and they actually had a, you know, probably the foremost green chemist in the country in, come in because his company has a, a new product that they're, this is more for regular asphalt, but I was just uh, thinking they could be allies in this. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, they're more focused on plain old roadways, I think, but they may have some expertise in this area and some perspective to offer. Um, okay. Right. The pavement preservation. Pavement preservation. Okay. Huh. So you, I know you mentioned that there's been legislation introduced state level to prohibit this in sealants, but is there a, I mean. Separate from the sealant application, is there a maximum allowable level of PAHs as a state level law, or is it an unregulated compound or contaminant? So this is what um, I believe DEQ is working on, um, specifically around stormwater sediments. I think there's a whole nother body of kind of thresholds and such for these brownfield or super fun sites where you know where it's an old gas plant that mm -hmm. has uh, really high concentrations of, of pHs from coal tar um, my understanding is that there is not um, required testing for pHs in stormwater sediments currently um, and so I don't want to speak outside of what I, I know well, but so let me follow up on that with you um, after. Um, but I believe that so there is a difference between the regulations and standards in Michigan than there were in Minnesota that enabled Minnesota to look at this as a really an economic problem. So we, do, we don't have that lever here, which means that there's something missing in you know at state level regulation that um, we don't have that more expensive disposal uh, aspect of this problem at this point. But um, the DEQ has done some sampling throughout Michigan to kind of understand the problem here and start uh, addressing that gap. I was trying to look up for the land application. Because there is, a, I'm sure there is a standard. I'm sure for land application of PAHs. Um, I don't know what it was. I, I can't get what. My, it's it's max. It's actually my guess, and I'd ha I mean, don't quote me on this, but my guess it's actually lower than the percent that's in this product. Well, if it's five to ten percent, yeah, I would hope so. <laughs> I mean, it's significantly lower. Yeah, and you know, so the the Milwaukee study that led to that ban. They, uh, so, you know, it's most concentrated at the point of application, and then it dilutes as it moves through the environment, right? So when they were looking at river sediments in Milwaukee, they were still finding that even with all that dilution factor, that uh, pHs in riverbed sediments were um, coming out at levels above, exceeding the probable effects concentrations. So that, that concentration above which you'd expect to see impact to aquatic organisms. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it is, it is occurring enough and concentrating enough in the environment that it's exceeding these 
these thresholds. The so what my understanding is, but but what we would have to confirm is that um, you there's a level of pH contamination in stormwater sediments that you can't that you have to kind of elevate which type of disposal facility <coughs> it goes to. Um, but it's not part of the required testing. Um, the, the, the toxics that need to be tested for uh, as a standard. And so you can't knowingly dispose of highly contaminated sediments, but you're also not required to look at that one specifically. And so you can unknowingly dispose of them. So that, that's my understanding. And that's why it's just kind of a gap in the, in the regulation. Um, so uh, we'd have to confirm that that's the case, but that's my understanding of where we're kind of falling through the cracks with the, the, the sediment disposal regs. So Peter, I have a question for you. Do, if, you know, if someone is doing construction that could raise silt and things like that, they're, on, they're required to both get permits and you know, put up silt fences and so forth, do an analysis of what possible um, dispersal of silt and whatever. Uh, runoff could happen, but do we have any permitting process for something like a repaving or a resurfacing like this? Is there, I mean, you know, if you're going to put something up on the side of your house, you have to get a permit yeah. practically, so I'm just Short curious. Short answer is no. So residential driveways or even property like Hobby Lobby wants to redo their commercial parking lot? No, we don't have anything. So unless they're tearing up pavement or doing some sort of work to the parking lot itself, they're going to resurface it. I don't even think we have something for resurfacing the parking lot. Hmm. So, hmm. yeah, well, that's definitely a gap in our um, regulations. Uh, this seems like a, you know, a thing that could be of significantly greater risk than a little bit of you know, sediment or silt you know, running off because the shape of the land has changed temporarily. In, in early it, discussions with communities about how to implement this, the permitting came up, um, but my you know what what we heard back was that's a pretty significant administrative burden especially if you're going to do it on every driveway household driveway and that's when the the registration alternative came up is you know still a point of contact but um less of an administrative burden than permitting every seal code application so it's well, fewer permitting people has to, talk to do to. with impacts on your neighbors too right i mean permitting is about you know setbacks and things like that i mean i, I to me, the way this is, you've described this, if, it, if it's putting your neighbors and their babies at risk, you know, people might desire that level of administrative control. I don't know. I'm just curious. So there's no place that's approached it that way? Not that I'm aware of, but okay. there's a lot of places that, you know, I haven't seen their, their ordinance or how they're implementing it. Interesting. Okay. There's another question for Peter. This may be premature, though. Uh, did you get a chance to look at the model ordinance? And if you did, did is there anything that you saw there that was, uh, from the planning department's perspective, problematic? <laughs> uh, I did read through it. I didn't notice anything problematic. Okay. Yet again, I'm new. I mean, I'm just okay. learning this today. So yeah. I'm assuming that they've done that. The model ordinance yeah. is tip top. Well, sure. Would it make sense to you that, I mean, it seems like the next logical s step is to get everybody on the environmental commission and the planning department an opportunity to review the model ordinance to see if there's any questions or concerns or is there something else we should be doing as a next step uh, i'll answer that uh, to start and rebecca can supplement um it seems like that's a prudent course of action we could review come back to what we've talked about today maybe let it sink in our next meeting and review the model ordinance in detail and decide if this is something that the environmental commission wants to you know pass a motion to initiate or encourage the planning commission of the board to initiate some kind of code amendment to move this i would imagine it'd be a non-zoning amendment so we would probably go right to the township board with it I anyway, th this is definitely an issue I'll raise with the, the commission. If, if, if it's initiated here, that would be fine. If not, uh, you know, I will be recommending that the commission initiate something. So. Well, do I, uh, I think, you know, a compelling case.
case is made for a township ban. And, uh, you know, I was talking to a, a friend about this, and she actually knew of the issue, and she said, oh, yeah, you know, I called up a number of sealers, and I asked them if they would be willing to do this, and they said, no, no, this is the, you know, we basically use the, uh, the coal tar product, and if you don't, uh, you know, that's just what we do. It's, and I think this is a good example of even, uh, you know, uh, conscientious citizens by themselves can't change the marketplace because they're one person and businesses are used to doing businesses a certain way. If you have an entire township uh, make a policy, then there's at least a few businesses that'll see it as an opportunity to uh, switch their practices. Yeah, and, and that's also why I you know, said nudge your neighbors too because I do feel like, uh, uh, you know, the more area within reach of uh, that company that, that does have the ordinance, the, it, the easier it actually makes it on them to, to um, you know, do business in, in your, you know, in a township that does have an ordinance. Uh, so, yeah. Are you gonna wrap up the Yeah, I'm just trying to think about do we feel as though we, we understand this issue enough to express an opinion about it now? I guess I want to ask the... I would, I would suggest we come back to it. I know Rebecca's got a long drive back, so we can probably thank her for coming, and we right. can talk amongst ourselves if that's what right. next action okay. we want to pursue on it. Because I have to get out of here, too. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you very much, Rebecca. This is really a, really an interesting uh, discussion. It reminds me of, uh, of the asbestos story, of course. And so <laughs> These things are very hard problems. Yeah. That's just lead. Yeah, yeah lead, right, right, right. Part of it is the way we look at how at materials that we use. Actually, coal tar used to in the 20s with when they town gas, they were actually marketing coal tar production sites as sanitariums for people with respiratory ailments. Right. Huh. Well, well, right. They also marketed cigarettes as, as things that yeah, somehow. Yeah, it's bizarre. I know. <laughs> well, the one link life. that I have heard between the cancers and the um, the coal tar were chimney sweeps. They were, you know, exposed to. Yeah, that's the original. That's the original PAH. Yeah, that's the story mm -hmm. I tell in every organic chemistry class. <laughs> <laughs> right. Percival yeah, pots. and you know, I mean, lead pipes made really good pipes, but they weren't. Good for us, you know, and that's what with this coal tar, it might make a great pavement sealant, but it's a terrible, you know, a product to have in our homes and near our water. So uh, we can do better. All right. Any other questions? Thank you very much, and thanks for coming all the way to, to tell us this story. Sure, no problem. And yeah. let me know if you have follow-up questions. I'm happy to work with you guys through this. Um, the ordinance has each each time it's it's been reviewed by a community, has gone through legal review, so, so it has had some substantial vetting, um, and you guys will do your own, but um, if you have any questions about that, let me know. Um, we're happy to help however we can. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.